What I'd like to do is welcome uh, Jane Treadwell uh, up to the stage, the CEO of DesignGov, who's going to give you a, a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, and um, it's great to be here. I'd like to thank Pia for telling me that she wasn't going to let you know that I was standing between you and your morning coffee. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, and also to Alex uh, and Alex, um, my colleagues in DesignGov, who said, why don't you do something different and go naked um, in terms of not making use of PowerPoints to hide behind, which I'm a very good PowerPoint hider behind a presenter. So I am going naked and let's see how that applies um, or can be done to be inspiring and wonderful today. Um, it's easy to be inspired to make a difference and to change something that matters, um, to have a meaningful impact on the ways that you work and on the people that you work for. Is it, do you think, or isn't it? And on reflecting on the words of sort of inspiration and innovation over uh, yesterday when Alex and I were in Adelaide, uh, we went over the sort of the people that had made an inspirational difference in our lives, the leaders that we'd worked for or, or had admired. Um, and I sort of reflected on being invited to go and do a round of golf with Bill Clinton once um, and don't know how to play golf, so I didn't want to sort of show that I was incompetent, so I said no. But it was a really nice little Tiffany box with fake green grass in it that I'd, I'd um, had this invitation from. But Clinton was a man that I had the chance to hear speak and he made the most amazing um, globally important issues come down to the experiences of dealing with one person and their lives and how that could then grow to something even more important for governments and people to deal with. Um, the innovative things that we've been able to achieve, you know, personally, um, as groups, as teams, you know, how is this possible um, to be a change maker in the, the places that we work under the conditions and controls and demands that we work with? And I was sort of reflecting too about what made it possible for me as a 23-year-old newly minted nutritionist and health promotion officer to move to Port Macquarie um, and conceive, barter with a whole lot of people in the community and run successfully a three-day health farm um, for disadvantaged women who had, uh, were living in dire straits, really, in a caravan park. And I promised them weight loss and a new set of healthy habits for the future with a ready-made support group. Now, how is it possible I had that freedom to actually explore and do something amazing and, and make a whole lot of us feel really great about doing some brilliant things? So what is the best mix of creativity and leadership, um, commitment from your colleagues and your organisation, the connectivities that you need to actually make those differences and the capabilities that you draw on? What is that best blend and do we have it and can we make it? So what I'd like to do, um, just to bring the sort of spotlight over to you guys for a minute, if you can think of what was the best idea you've ever had and been able to implement, just sort of note that down either virtually or on a piece of paper, and and what made that possible? What were the key ingredients? What were the elements that actually enabled you to translate a good idea into sort of something um, concrete and then actually be able to diffuse that through to sort of making that massive difference? Easy to do? You've got those just all sorted out in your head? Because I am going to ask. <laughs> So in true designerly style, um, I'm going to sort of try and apply one of the interesting methods that we as three-year-olds um, might have sort of driven our parents mad about. I certainly know that my three-year-olds drove me mad actually asking why. 
And I don't think they stopped at why five times. But it's a really great technique for really getting to the bottom of why it is that something is important enough to actually uh, focus on. And the, the th five whys about um, dealing with the problem or the opportunity to how might we inspire innovation across the public sector? Why might we do it? Well, obviously, it's to build engagement with our staff. Um, but why is that important? Well, perhaps it's to build high-performance organisations and teams. But why is that important? Well, perhaps it's to surpass government and citizen expectations and deliver better public outcomes, because that's why we're here. And, and why is that important? Well, it's to make a difference, isn't it? Isn't that the, why, the reason why people actually join the public sector, to actually make a difference? But more than that, it's to make a difference in the lives of Australians and to have and put meaning and purpose into ours. And I think when you've got those connections of it, um, you get sort of goosebumps, but you also get the ability to sort of jump out of bed in a really cold morning in Canberra and go, yay, I'm going to do this. But then the other element of this sort of five whys technique is to then sort of look at the how. How are we going to inspire innovation across the public sector? And, and that might be some of the elements that you've identified in terms of what made it possible for you to translate a great idea into action. Um, certainly, it's written up in a range of um, documents and reports and experiences, but certainly, too, there's sort of being able to ignite the enthusiasm of the people around you around a passion about making that difference um, thinking and acting and communicating the importance of actually changing uh, the lives of people that matter um, in your portfolio, your business, your, your um, ecosystem of influence. Um, to demonstrate by doing, no one's ever made a great idea happen by not doing it. And I think in the, the sort of design and innovation sorts of spaces, you can talk a long, a long, long time about why things are important, but you only actually start making that difference by actually getting out, and it might be prototyping, but actually having a shot, because it's only from that shot or having a crack, as Chris Eccles in New South Wales say, that you actually learn from what is possible. And then, of course, in the leadership side of things, giving, um, I used to have a boss um, who, had a number of really great homilies that were quite useful at times. And she used to say, ask forgiveness, not permission. Um, because imagine that, to actually have the support of the people um, up the line that are actually encouraging you. Uh, she also said, let 10,000 flowers bloom, which in Centrelink was a little bit tricky at times. I had a job trying to kill off some of those flowers. Um, but, but, you know, that environment of support, um, understanding that uh, you only actually get to have a go and fail in a supported environment, and that sort of, if you continue to have to ask for permission, you'll only ever have a whole lot of briefs or things written in front of you, rather than finding out what actually works and what doesn't. Of course, this is a bit tricky in our time of sort of managing risk or avoiding risk. But so then what is it that you need to actually have the space and the freedom to be creative and having a shot? And of course, um, when I was the CIO in Centrelink, I made sure that we had some sand pits so that we didn't have to try too many things out live in the sort of production environment, which was important for making a lot of payments to a lot of citizens. Um, but there are also the sort of opportunities to have a, a shot early, um, prototyping, giving, giving birth to little trials and experiments so that you can learn as you go. And I was really excited to hear that there is a thing called National Failure Day in Finland. And, and um, anyone heard of that? So October the 13th is National Failure Day. And, and what is that to do? Well, it's, 
it's actually owned by a lot of people who've been amazing success stories, um, who've done brilliant products and businesses and services across Finland. And why do they have it? It's because these people say they wouldn't have been successful unless they'd actually failed a lot. And that they've, you know, one person reckons that he, he failed 10,000 times in order to become a great success. So it's sort of owning failure as a stepping stone. And, you know, when you sort of hear of things like that, how do we actually bring that into our space about failing forward as the head of the ACT government says, um, failing intelligently, failing early, in order to learn a lot from the mechanisms and ideas that sort of translate into a good, a good action, but only by not sort of relying on a whole lot of desktop perfectionist thinking. I think the other, one of the other things that I've certainly seen and experienced is if you have a really clear vision or an endpoint that's translated not in terms of what it means to me, but how, from a government perspective, how citizens and businesses and communities will experience a difference by what it is we do. And, and that's the job of the leaders to navigate the path. And certainly, a long time ago, there were um, community-based um, studies, both in America and in Australia, by the telecommunications companies. I think it was telecom at the time. And what was it that made Americans enjoy and pursue a different outcome? And it was that they loved chaos. They loved shaping chaos. They didn't mind failing because that was culturally OK, and that they could craft and do something to actually make that and come real. In Australia, it was quite different, that from a leadership perspective, the key is to actually define that endpoint, but also identify the stops along the way so that people can become familiar enough to actually uh, join in and, and know that there is a change journey, but these are the things that they can expect to see. Of course, um, you can't actually inspire innovation without tools and skills and frameworks. And we're pretty good at that in the public sector, having frameworks. Um, perhaps we're not so good at actually sharing the things that work, the tools that count, the experiences of whether they're great ones or bad ones, but we are getting better. And, and what is it that the leaders need to do about those tools or frameworks? They need to actually be there um, removing the roadblocks. Because I think in this room there's a power of ideas and competency and capability. But there are certainly, as we're finding in DesignGov, quite a few rules that sort of get in the way of actually getting on and working across government or achieving even sort of minor breakthroughs in order to achieve those massive ones. Um, and, and certainly the jobs are to actually gain confidence and you know, learn as you grow and go. And, and encouraging that confidence means encouraging the potential that people have, tackling the ideas and making them real. And so, of course, all of these things, it's actually about people. It's not about technology. It's not about um, structures. It's actually about choices and behaviours and, and listening and, and creating the sort of the empathy and of who the citizens and our ecosystem of interests are. And I suppose this is the, um, one of the sort of amazing things that, that you do over a lifetime, really, of a career in the public sector where making a difference counts to the people that you work and live with. And, and um, an interesting piece of um, fact is that in terms of creating innovative organisations, creating that environment where people actually have the power to have a go and make a difference. Um, the Business Review Weekly and Inventium, a small company that sort of looked at what were the conditions for organisations to be innovative. One of the critical things was that the um, executives don't just delegate 
the role and responsibility to be innovative, but they do the discovery. They actually demonstrate by doing. So I suppose the, the key is for all of us to demonstrate by doing or talking and lifting up the, our sights to what's possible and what needs to actually change in order to be effective. I suppose in terms of that sort of thing and the conditions for public servants at a time, over time, things have gotten more deliberate in terms of what we have to do, the conditions and the controls around what we are part of, and how do we actually deal with the risk in our environment. Um, certainly the creation of DesignGov as an intermediary in looking at how innovation and it, design-driven innovation can actually make a difference to the white space, the space between the policies and programs and structures of government. Um, that's something that DesignGov is really focusing on. We're a multi-agency collaborative platform really spanning the white space between departments, the space where citizens and businesses and communities sometimes fall when they're trying to make their lives better or get something done. And, and in the creation of DesignGov, we're seeking to apply design and design thinking across the APS and other public sectors and other um, sectors themselves to tackle the wicked problems, which um, as Ken Friedman from the University um, of Technology, Swinburne University of Technology said, you know, you don't actually solve wicked problems, but you can make them better. Um, go away, and that, and that the wicked problem is a construct of fragmentation of a system, as well as the interests of many individual parties. And by bringing all of those parties into the space to not just do user-centered sort of tick and flicks on website designs, but actually help craft and design the problem from a space where people can actually make the difference. So that's what we're seeking to do with you. Um, design is a process that takes the current state to a future better state. And, and design can be good, or you can probably think of design features that have been really bad, but it is an active process. So what we're doing in DesignGov over our 18 month period of um, pilot existence um, is to apply design in the white spaces of wicked problems. And the first easy wicked problem that we're dealing with is the relationship and interactions between the public sector and businesses. And in that, um, there are a number of projects underway which we're very keen to get you involved, if you wish, through um, ethnography, field work with 10, 12 to 16 businesses. Um, another project we were in Adelaide with yesterday um, with the South Australian Government and the Australian Centre for Social Innovation and the Kafka Brigade is to actually apply a different methodology to understanding the experiences of businesses in dealing with government. We've got um, a dialogue app that's inviting businesses and public servants to actually identify the issues they're having in trying to provide good service or seek good information and advice between business and government. And we're even prototyping already. So design is a messy space, but it's exciting. Um, we are also trying to build capability of the decision makers and practitioners in the use of design tools and techniques through engagement, through um, professional development, through forums, um, through and supported by an international advisory group to actually give advice to us as to how some of these, what might seem crazy things or unusual, can become real to actually help us take that step into the, the sort of unknown with support. And of course, one of the important things to actually build the capacity to tackle wicked problems across um, government is to have a shared language. Um, we have many different ways of doing things and to, in order to actually build capacity across the public sector to actually tackle wicked problems, to apply different techniques to doing things that make a difference for citizens, um, is to have the skills 
and the language that allow things to happen beyond the boundaries of one's organisation to many. I think in the end, uh, when I started this job, I learned a lot about design. Um, but one of the best guides I had from um, someone in the private sector doing design-driven innovation was, he said, design is all around methods. It's also around mindsets. Um, because with the mindset that you bring the ecosystem and all of the the network into the space to actually define and then design a, a, a set of solutions to solve those problems is a really different mindset to the ones that we might have been used to in old style public sector approaches. And it's also about faith because once you hand over um, the, the seeking of solutions beyond your staff to bringing the citizen right into your space, to bring the network of interests into your space to both define and guide the solutions. You're, you have lost some form of control here, but in fact what you're doing is actually reducing the risk of those policies and services having no resonance with the people it is that you're building them for. Just like to finish in sort of saying, that um, when I was in previous jobs, we always looked for where were the burning platforms? Where was the driver to actually make people move to the side or forward on a sort of a dramatic shift? Um, and I think we're actually approaching them if we're not already in it. They're sort of approaching the tough times, the austerity times, when the expectations for us in government are doing things differently, sure, but doing things with massively reduced dollars and possibly more demanding interests and insights about what it is that government and the public sector should be doing. Um, so there's our burning platform and how is it that we're actually going to deliver different results? It's not going to be doing the same old thing in the same old way. It's actually going to be applying things in a different manner. Um, wearing the shoes of citizens, bringing in the citizens and our ecosystem into the way in which we do things. I'm um, lucky enough to be going to, I hope I'm lucky enough to be going to Rwanda next week. And, and uh, they're looking at how to apply innovation and, and ICT to making Rwanda smart the government of Rwanda smart from a perspective of their people. They're actually looking at the term and the definition of smart meaning more for less, so we've heard that before, but for more people. Um, if they can do it, I think we can too. And um, let's see what we can build from today moving forward. Thank you. <laughs>